God, thank you for the truth of those words that we get to sing as those who know the truth, yet not I, but Christ in me. God, we pray that Christ would display his glory through us. Uh, What a privilege it is to be used for that end alone. This is why we exist. This is why you made us. And so we pray that we would be effective conduits for your glory alone, even as we will discover now in the ways that we greet one another. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll look at one verse tonight. Verse 26, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 26. That passage reads... Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. We've all seen it in the movies, or we've heard of it in fairy tales, or we've read of it in novels. There's an incredibly intense battle scene, action-packed, The often unexpected hero of the story almost dies as he attempts to rescue the kingdom or save the universe or stop the supervillain's sinister scheme. And somehow, some way, against all odds, he escapes death, he rescues the girl, and finally, now that the danger has waned and the day is won, the hero... And the girls stand there embracing one another. They stare longingly into each other's eyes. And they kiss. It's difficult with the commonness of that storyline stuck in your mind probably. How many times you've seen that played out, read of it, watched it etc. It's hard to uh, avoid confusion when we open up our Bibles and read this very command to kiss one another. That just sounds strange to our modern ears. With all the baggage that we bring at times to our Bibles, we often don't know what in the world to do with a command like this one. We're tempted to assume that this must be a metaphorical kiss. Paul could not be literal here. I mean, isn't that just germy? This must be some sort of, uh, if it's not metaphorical, if it is literal, then it must just be a, really formal, proper peck on the cheek or something? Or some symbolic spiritual smooch, perhaps? Not to be taken at face value. While the holy kiss is none of those things, it's not a metaphor for something else, it's not formal and detached and cold, and it's not merely symbolic either. This command was intended to establish an absolutely otherworldly practice setting Christians apart from every other group in the entire world at the time. That's what this is. And if we understand what this practice meant to the original audience, like the church of the Thessalonians, then we too can similarly 
set ourselves apart in our own day in an equally otherworldly manner. I'm convinced of that. So, for our outline tonight, obedience to this biblical command requires an understanding of three particulars. Obedience to this biblical command requires an understanding of three particulars. Let me just read them for you up front. It's first off, the first particular is understanding the obligation for everyone. And then understanding the history of the Jews in particular. And finally, the third particular is understanding the significance for the church. The obligation for everyone, the history of the Jews, and the significance for the church. So first, this first particular that we must understand in order to obey this biblical command is simply the obligation for everyone. Look back at our passage, 1 Thessalonians 5, 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. This includes an imperative or a command, and that's the first word there in your English translation, greet. Greet, this is something for you to go do. It's imperative, it's an obligation, it's a command. Greet. This word simply meant to engage in hospitable recognition of another person. Engage in hospitable recognition of another person. To greet them. The recipients of, or rather the actors inherent in this command, greet. Paul is talking to the church of the Thessalonians. It's a second person plural. Y'all, you all, as the church, greet. This is for y'all to do. The audience is identified in the first verse of the book, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. So this is to the church of the Thessalonians, this entire letter, and this command in particular is to the church of the Thessalonians. Each member was to practice this biblical command, to greet and then all the brethren. The actors, the ones who carried out this biblical command, were the members of the church, in Thessalonica, the recipients of this greeting were all the brethren, all the brethren, no one's off limits. Each member was called to greet each member, if you will. Draw no distinctions among yourselves, slave or free, noble or not, rich or poor, man or woman, greet one another. Greet all the brethren. The recipients are all the brethren. And the particular gesture with which the greeting was supposed to come was a kiss. A kiss. The gesture was a kiss. It was not According to Paul's words, up to the Thessalonians, how they would greet one another. The particular gesture that he requires of them is a kiss, not a handshake or some other form of greeting. Paul specifically identifies the way that he wants them greeting one another. It is a kiss. And the standard by which this greeting, this kiss was to come, was holiness. Holiness. The standard was holiness. Just as the gesture 
itself was defined for them, so was the standard by which they had to practice this gesture. It was holiness. It had to be a holy kiss. This means that it had to be set apart. It had to be other and set apart specifically as pure or righteous or upright. Even a kiss that was worthy of wearing this title of holiness would be worthy of representing the holy God of the church. God who is holy ought to be able to be represented by the kind of kiss that you give one another in your greeting. This was to be a kiss that was worthy of God. This is not the only place that this practice is commanded by the apostles. Most often in the New Testament, this is by Paul, but this appears as a one another practice in numerous other places. Consider Romans 16, 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you, Paul wrote. 1 Corinthians 16, 20. All the brothers send you greetings, Paul wrote. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13, 12. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And then even Peter, as the same command, 1 Peter 5, 14. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So the obligation is clear enough. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And if I'm effective tonight, we'll be practicing this within the hour. Hang in there. Don't get nervous. The obligation is clear enough. There's nothing strange or unclear or ambiguous about Paul's words or any of the other passages where the command appears. But this doesn't tell us why the apostle requires this greeting. It doesn't tell us that. So why this in the greeting? Why a holy kiss? Why not some other gesture of hospitable reception between the members of the church. To discover the answer to that question, we do not have to become experts of first century Greco-Roman culture. Because the answer, why the holy kiss, lies less in New Testament culture and more in the Old Testament scriptures. That's so helpful for God to give us all that we need in the scriptures. This could have been a practice uh, between inferiors and superiors to kiss the hand, perhaps as a sign of reverence. There's testimony that this occurred to some degree in the first century world. But even that doesn't answer our question. Why is the church to practice this with all the brethren? Because this relationship isn't one of superior and inferior necessarily. The answer is found in the Old Testament scriptures, which brings us to our second particular that we must understand to obey this biblical command is the history of the Jews, the history of the Jews. The Jewish scriptures, often known as the Tanakh, uh, T-N-K for short, those consonants would have captured the three sections of the Hebrew Bible, even Jesus and Paul's Old Testament scriptures, T-N-K, the Torah, the Nivi'im, 
and Kituvim, the law, the prophets, and the writings were the three sections that the entire Old Testament would have fit in, and they would have been even arranged in that order, the law, prophets, and writings. The law would have included what Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The prophets would have been divided into uh, what's called the former and latter prophets or the narrative and commentary. That would have included Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings would have been the narrative. And then the commentary would have been Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the 12 minor prophets. That would have been included in the prophets. And then in the writings section of scripture would have included Ruth, Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Lamentations, Daniel, Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah, which would have been one book, and then First and Second Chronicles, which would have also been one book like First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. And so you will get in that list about 22 books of the Old Testament. Now we count 39. The difference in number is simple to account for. Samuel was a book. Kings was a book. The minor prophets were called the Twelve. They were a book. And Ezra and Nehemiah were a book. First and Second Chronicles were a book. So the difference in number is not a matter of what we actually include in the canon, but simply how they were counted. In these Old Testament scriptures, we get the history of the Jews, particularly the history of the very thing that we are studying tonight, the kiss. The New Testament command, I'm convinced, only makes sense when you know what the Old Testament says about that practice. And so tonight, I'm going to aim high and take us through every single one of those Old Testament passages. Everywhere kissing appears in your Bible is what we're going to look at tonight. This is an evening service, so we've got only two hours. You should be okay. We're going to fly actually through these. We won't take that long. But this is going to require us to do quite a bit of work and quite a little bit of time. And so turn first to Genesis 27. Genesis 27 is the first place that this appears, a reference to a kiss. And as we fly through these passages, what I want you to do is pay close attention to the relationship between the individuals giving the kisses to one another. Pay particular attention to the relationship between those individuals that are kissing one another. As one theologian said, all roads lead back to Torah. When it comes to scripture, When it comes to studying doctrine, all roads lead back to Torah. I appreciate that because even though the Torah, we don't want to elevate it in uh, importance to other biblical books, God has spoken all of them with equal authority, and so they are equally authoritative and necessary for us. But the Torah does possess a unique place in the canon simply because it was the first of what was written in the scriptures. And so oftentimes what you find is other biblical doctrines find their origin in the law, in the Pentateuch, what Moses wrote. And so usually if you can get a get your arms around what Moses said about a particular doctrine, then you're well on your way to understanding everything else the Bible says about it. That holds true on the subject of kissing. What you will find as we go through these scriptures is that there are very few 
references to romance, there are only three. So the, the example that I gave at the beginning of the romantic kiss, the way that it happens in the movies so often, is not the primary way the Bible trains us to think about kissing. The first reference as we move through these, as I said, is in Genesis chapter 27, verses 26 and 27. There are about uh, actually less than 40 passages where kissing is mentioned, and they occur sometimes in clusters, as we'll see here. So verse 26, Genesis 27, Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come close and kiss me, my son. This is talking to Jacob, who's deceiving his father. So he came close and kissed him. And when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed, etc. So that's the first couple references you have to kissing. It is a son to a father. The father asking his son to come close and kiss him. They are family. Genesis 29, verses 11 through 13 are your next references. Genesis 29, verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. He has found an end to his search, looking for the family of Laban. Rachel is it. So he kisses her and weeps. Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. So when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to, the, to his house. So he related to Laban all these things. Jacob kissed Rebekah, or excuse me, Rachel. Jacob kissed Rachel and then Laban Jacob's uncle kisses Jacob. Again, the relationship is family. Genesis 31, verse 28. Start at verse 27. Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with joy and with songs, with timbrel and with lyre? This is Laban speaking to Jacob at a much later date. Jacob has fallen out of favor with his uncle at this point. Laban goes on in verse 28, and did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Speaking of Jacob's own children. Now you have done foolishly. Jump down to verse 55 in the same chapter. Early in the morning, Laban arose after he's made peace with Jacob and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Then Laban departed and returned to his place. Again, all of those references are between members of the same family unit or the same uh, family, extended family. Excuse me. Your next reference is a couple chapters later, Genesis 33, verse 4. Then Esau ran to meet him, that is Jacob or Israel, and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. This is the next time that they have seen each other since Jacob has fled from his brother Esau because he deceived Isaac and took the promises, took the blessing. And so what do they do? Esau doesn't seek to kill him as he promised, but instead he falls on his neck and kisses his brother. Again, the relationship there is what? Family. They are brothers. Genesis 45 verse 15 is your next reference. If you don't get all of these, they're on the, uh, the outline online. If you 
don't want to write all these references down and want to go back and find them, you can find them online. Genesis 45, 15 says, He kissed all his brothers and wept on them, and afterward his brothers talked with him. That's a reference to Joseph uh, when he reveals himself in Egypt, finally. Again, he doesn't retaliate in hatred or anger to his brothers, but instead he kissed all his brothers. He weeps on them for joy of seeing them, and then they converse. Genesis 48, verse 10 Israel is about to die at this point. And so in faith, he prophesies he's going to uh, make Joseph's sons as much his own sons as Joseph and Joseph's brothers. This is why you get Manasseh and Ephraim being tribes. And sometimes they are called Joseph in the Old Testament. But Joseph doesn't his tribe, his one tribe, is replaced by Manasseh and Ephraim. Levi doesn't get a portion, and so that's how you still end up with 12 tribes. Here, in Genesis 48, Now the eyes of Israel were so dim from age that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them close to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. As his own sons. Again, the relationship here is kissing, uh, or excuse me, is family that are kissing. They are members of the same family. Genesis 50, verse 1, is the final reference in Genesis. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. On his deathbed, a son to a beloved father, he kisses him. Those are all of your Genesis references to kissing. In each one of those instances that we just read, what's the relationship? Family. The next reference is Exodus 4, verse 27. God is commissioning Moses. He sends him out. Now Yahweh said to Aaron, because Moses clearly needs some help communicating, go to meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Aaron kissed his brother Moses. Another family relationship. Exodus 18 is your next reference. Verse 7. Then Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down, a sign of great reverence, and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. This is after the Exodus, on their way to Canaan, the land of promise. Jethro meets them, brings Moses' wife and sons. What does he do when he sees his father-in-law, one of his family? He kisses him. Those are all of your references in the law, in the Torah, to kissing. In every single one of those instances, the relationship between the people kissing is familial. They have a family relationship. What do we find in the prophets? Go to 1 Samuel 10 verse 1. This is the first non-familial kiss. This is Samuel to Saul, the, who re, he recognizes Saul as the first king of Israel. 
Then Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, Has not Yahweh anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? He is overjoyed um, over finding Saul. His own search has been brought to an end. And in an act of great joy, when he anoints the soon-to-be king of Israel, he kisses him. There is joy there. The next reference, first second, uh, excuse me, First Samuel twenty, verse forty-one. This is between David and Jonathan. He realizes that, uh, or they they can't stay uh, close to one another. Verse 41 says, when the lad was gone, that is to go get the arrow, David rose from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times, and they kissed each other and wept together. But David wept the more. This dear friend of his, like a brother, At this parting, David shows great respect for Jonathan, and they kiss. 2 Samuel 14 is your next reference. Verse 33. This is the... um, Outside of the family relationship, a display of treachery. Um, Verse 33, so when Joab came to the king and told him, he called for Absalom, or thus he came to the king and prostrated himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed him. Excuse me, this isn't the the first treacherous uh, example, but this is David to Absalom. The king receives his son Absalom back, and he kisses him. You have here uh, a display from David that he's receiving Absalom favorably. So there's a reconciliation evident here. This next reference, however, in the very next chapter, verse 5, Absalom, now that he's been favorably received by his father David, the king, is going to begin to plan a coup to overthrow David. And a part of that years-long plan to overthrow King David, what does he do? Verse 5, 2 Samuel 15. And when a man came near to prostrate himself before Absalom... He would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. What's he doing there? He is gaining the favor of the people so that when he's ready to hatch this plot, he has favor with the people. He's demonstrated a unity and delight in every man in the kingdom, if you will, coming into Jerusalem so that he has their favor. The next reference is 1939 of 2 Samuel. We're about halfway done here. 1939. All the people crossed over the Jordan, and the king crossed too. The king then kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his place. David has finally been restored as king, and this man who has shown him favor, David responds with a favorable act and kisses him. And he adds to that a blessing. 
the next chapter, verse 9, Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand and kissed him. Not sure any of you men in the room would want somebody grabbing you by your beard, going in for a kiss. This was uh, a display that we are reconciled. There is nothing any longer between these two men who used to be, uh, who were supposed to be enemies. But verse 10, but Amasa was not on guard against the sword. Why should he be? He's being kissed. The sword which was in Joab's hand, so he struck him in the belly with it and poured out his inward parts on the ground and did not strike him again, and he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. This was a treacherous use of the kiss to say, there's peace between us. Don't worry when that actually wasn't the case. And so the kiss, which should have been a sign of unity and reconciliation, was instead used to commit an act of great treachery. He killed him with a kiss. Your next reference, fast forward to Second, uh, First Kings, rather, chapter 19. This is Elijah calling Elisha to be the prophet in his place. First Kings 19, starting at 18, you have a couple references to kissing here. Uh, before Elisha is called, just before that, verse 18, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, Yahweh says, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is one of those references that would have been from a, an inferior to a superior, in this case, uh, uh, a, a servant to his God, to the idol, Baal. So every mouth that has not kissed the idol or paid homage with a kiss is the reference here. So kisses not only happen between family, not at only were a display of reconcil uh, reconciled relationships, but also of uh, reverence and homage. So that is, Elijah departed from there, verse 19, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him, and he with the 12th, and Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I to do? For what have I done to you? So he returned from following him, took a pair of ox, oxen, and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen, gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. So Elisha goes back home to kiss his mother and father. You have there a, uh, a parting greeting. But it's again between family. And then the final reference in the prophets, or what would have been known by uh, the Jews as the prophets, occurs in Hosea chapter 13, verse 2. Hosea 13, 2 reads, And now they sin more and more and make for themselves molten images, idols skillfully made from their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. They say of them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. There's another reference to, uh, to kiss, the kiss being used as an act of homage to a false god. So the only references left in the Old Testament occur in the writings. There are nine of them. The first is in Ruth. Flip back to Ruth. Joshua judges Ruth. Chapter 1, verse 9. And then again in verse 14. 
Naomi speaking to her two daughters-in-law is telling them to go back to their own parents' homes because none of them have husbands any longer. They've all died. Naomi can't do anything for them as a widow in Moab. So she wishes them the best and says in verse 9, May Yahweh grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Verse 14, And they lifted up their voices and wept again and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law but Ruth clung to her. So there, a bidding of farewell, uh, a parting greeting, happening between, again, family members. In this case, mother-in-law and daughter-in-laws. Job is the next reference in the writings. Job chapter 31, verse 27 Job is defending his own righteousness one final time. And he, like a couple other references that we've seen, uses the kiss to refer to uh, homage done to an idol. In this case, verse 26, if I have looked at the sun when it shone or the moon moving in splendor and my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, That is sort of like a a blowing a kiss gesture in worship to the sun and the moon. Job is implying here that he has not done that. He hasn't used the kiss this way. Psalm 2 verse 12 is the next reference. Verse uh, 12 gives these instructions. Kiss the son, this son whom God has set on Zion, his king. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The kiss there being, again, homage done. The only uh, other reference you have in the Psalms is Psalm 85. Psalm 85, verse 10. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, Yahweh will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. In a poetic way, steadfast love and faithfulness are said to meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. There is, again, another reference. Even though it's poetic, the idea there is that they are perfectly in unison harmoniously joined together. They're reconciled just like friends. You have three references in the Proverbs. Chapter 7 is the first one. So we're almost done here. A reference to the adulteress. This is uh, one instance, one of the three instances of the romantic usages. She, the adulterer, seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face, she says to him, and then she goes on. This adulteress seizes this foolish youth. She kisses him romantically. She's doing, by the way, what is done in what we'll see is the marriage relationship a relationship between husband and wife, also family members. But there it is used in a romantic sense. Also, Proverbs 24, 26 says, whoever gives an honest honest answer kisses the lips. 24, 26, whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. He shows favor. 
who gives an honest answer is the idea there. And then 27, verse 6, says this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Simply meaning the wounds that come from a friend ought to be deemed good or faithful. Even something as favorable as a kiss when it comes from an enemy ought to not be trusted. It is treacherous and they abound. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. The only other references occur in Song of Solomon. The only other references in the Old Testament. And you can guess, if you're familiar with that book, what they're about. The bride says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Chapter 1, verse 2. And then the other reference is chapter 8, verse 1. This is interesting. What does this bride say pre-marriage? Oh, that you were like a brother to me, she says of her husband-to-be, who nursed at my mother's breasts. Why is she wishing that her husband-to-be was like a brother? Because if I found you outside, I would kiss you, and none would despise me. Meaning, for her, she can't kiss him yet, but if they were siblings, they could. If they were family, they could. She looks forward to that day that they are family. There's a lesson in that for singles in a dating relationship. If you want to know more about how this study applies to dating, you can ask the uh, singles in the 414 ministry in like six or eight weeks. We'll get there. The other references are in the New Testament. There's uh, primarily those references in the New Testament have to do with Judas kissing Jesus. When you understand what we just read, that over a fourth of the references in the Old Testament have to do with kisses between family Family members, the Old Testament shows us, kiss. This is something that happened in Jewish culture between family, within the family relationship. That was the sphere primarily where the kiss took place. That's important. Outside of family relationships, the kiss indicated, as you saw, joy in one another, and reconciled, favorable relationships. There's love, there's joy, there's peace happening in relationships, not only between the family, but even outside the family. That's what's the case between those who are kissing. So you think about Judas and Jesus asking the question, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas? Really? The kiss indicating we're family or like family, at peace, mutual affection exists between us. We are reconciled. Would you betray me in that way? That made the the kiss all the more treacherous. And then you have in Acts 20 with the elders in Ephesus, they kiss. Paul and the elders in Ephesus embrace and weep and kiss one another. That's Acts 20, 37. So here's the conclusion. The biblical evidence shows that the kiss primarily took place between family members and was often a display of deep, abiding affection between those in a loving, joyful, 
harmonious relationship with one another. Back in 1 Thessalonians 5, if this is the biblical evidence showing us that the kiss primarily took place between family members and was a display of deep abiding affection between those in a loving, joyous, harmonious relationship with one another, Read the command again in our passage with that in mind. Paul tells the church of the Thessalonians, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. On display in the way that the church greeted one another was love, joy, and reconciliation, love, joy, and peace. And what is the particular familial word in the very passage? Greet whom? All the brethren, brothers, family of God. This would have been otherworldly in the New Testament. Acts 17 verses 1 to 9 record what happened when Paul went into Thessalonica. There were Jews, some of them prominent leaders in the city, prominent women who were rescued and believed the gospel. They were saved into the church as well as Gentiles who were not prominent, Jews who were not prominent. You would have had Prominent women, people who were rich, kissing those who were poor. You would have had women kissing other women and men, and men kissing men and other women. You would have had slaves kissing freemen. You would have had freemen kissing slaves. You would have had masters kissing slaves and slaves kissing their masters. Where else would people see that? Nowhere in the greetings of the church. This would have been unique. And to outsiders watching this strange group of who knows what this is, who are you? Why are you doing that? What is that about? Well, let me tell you about my God and Father who rescued us from our sins, from the wrath to come, saved us into the same body and made us family. He has reconciled us to himself and he has reconciled us to one another. And now people who would have had nothing to do with each other exist in this loving, harmonious, joyous, newfound relationship in the body of Christ. Yes, greet one another with a holy kiss. Please. That was the third particular that we need to understand, the significance for the church. This historical, this practice that was historically practiced by the Jews gets newly adapted by the New Testament church as a statement of brotherhood, a statement, a display of affection and proof of reconciliation between members of Christ's body. In the very greetings, nothing's wasted in the church, not even the greetings. So you know what that means for us? 21st century New Testament church, we shouldn't waste our greetings either. Does this mean that we should kiss one another? No, it actually doesn't. So you can, you know, if you were holding your breath there, you can breathe a sigh of relief. This does not mean that we should kiss one another because think of, again, what the apostles are after. What's God after? He's after a particular display of family, relationship, love, peace, joy. You Kissing doesn't necessarily display those things in our culture, does it? 
But the point is, how would you greet family? You wouldn't greet family like you would greet a stranger, would you? You wouldn't greet family like you greet your coworkers, would you? Then we should think carefully about how we greet one another. It ought to be more than strangers, more than coworkers, more than every other unbeliever whom you might show some kind of love for. It ought to demonstrate something more like the way you greet family. If I could just suggest, humbly suggest for our context, a suitable greeting that would make us at Grace Bible Church look more like family, what about an embrace? What about a hug? When you find yourself by chance meeting other members of Grace Bible Church at some random place like, I don't know, Sagebrush? It's like the second meeting place. <laughs> how, do you, how do you greet the members? How does that look when people who perhaps work at Sagebrush who are unbelievers, or just happen to be in the coffee shop, see, oh man, they're really excited to see each other. They're not just, they're not strangers. They actually have a relationship that's beyond the average person. The way we greet one another, I would argue from this text, ought to say that to the unbelievers watching us. And so, maybe that does provide for some awkwardness as you thoughtfully consider how to greet one another in the future in a way that's appropriate culturally and yet signifies this love and peace and joy and family relationship. But we can, we can navigate awkwardness, right, for the glory of God? I think so. I think the, the, the price of, of navigating that is worth it. If you're not a hugger, I might ask you, can, can I hug you? And I might hug you anyway, if you say no. You better have another idea of how to accomplish this biblical command if it's not that way. This is the significance of, of this command. It was all throughout the New Testament. The church practiced it, and the greeting, even the greeting, was not wasted. We should not waste our greetings. We can glorify God. We can say something otherworldly in the very practice of greeting one another. And we can put on display what doesn't exist anywhere else, that God loves to save sinners by adoption, through propitiation, through the cost of his own son. He loves to adopt sons to himself. Amen. God, thank you so much for a passage like this, even the sufficiency of the scriptures being on display um, as we see reference after reference uh, that shows how you're training us to think about this human practice. I pray that Grace Bible Church would be a, uh, a light in this world, that we would uh, be eager to love one another in sincerity and, and that even the displays of affection in our greeting would uh, be evidence of what's truly there, that we would work hard to maintain brotherly affection, that we would work hard to maintain harmonious relationships between us and maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and that all of uh, our labors would spill over into our greetings and in our fellowship and in our conversations and in our encouragements and in our comforts and our service to one another, that you would be pleased to use all these things to bring yourself great, great praise. 
in Tempe and in the world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.